Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Encounter Sounds podcast. I'm so glad um, to be able to record another one for you guys. And today I have a very, very special guest, a dear friend. Uh, we've been playing together now for, I think, five years. And lot many, many hours playing in the presence of God. It's mm -hmm. been an honor for me. And she's an amazing mom, musician, wife, friend. And I'm very excited that she's joining us today. I welcome Anna Ivy. Thank you. How you doing? Oh, that was so sweet. <laughs> Good. Been a mom today. My oldest got braces, so just doing life. Uh -huh. She has four amazing kids. Uh, see if I, I'm going to remember Ariana, Isabella, Oliver, and Charlie. Right. Yes. Hello, guys. And uh, love you guys. Their the kids go to school with my kids, and it's a lot of fun. But I'm I'm I've been wanting to do this for a while. You know, we've been doing this together for a few years now. But I I kind of even for myself, I don't fully know your your whole story. And I think uh, we see you up there playing and worshiping and. Your frequency is so special to our family and to our sound. I feel like you are right now. You kind of uh, are the soundtrack of the of the the house. So it's always your sound is always there, impregnating the, the 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 church. So I appreciate that very much. And but I'd love to hear your story. You know okay. where you grew up, and and we go from there and okay. and learn a little bit. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. So I am originally from South Carolina. I was raised right below Greenville. So being back in Greenville when we ended up back there and being back in South Carolina was like really like homecoming for me. So I was raised in Pelzer. I'm kin to um, Sharon Dorn. We're actually fifth cousins. Our grandmothers um, grew up together. but. Wow. Isn't that crazy? No, no. So I was raised, um, I was raised non-denominational. My dad was a worship pastor or worship. He led music. We'll put it that way. <laughs> Cause on this side of it, it was just music in a lot of ways. But so I was raised in, um, I'll just kind of put this out there. Cause it's kind of part of the journey. I was raised in we loved the Lord. My mom loved the Lord. My grandfather was um, a minister with the um, Assemblies of God. He actually resigned that because he did construction and he started preaching on the job site during his lunch break. And they're like, you can preach in church or you can preach on the job site. That's the rules. And he said, well, I'll, I'm going to preach to the people who need me. Uh -huh. So I was raised very, we loved, loved Jesus. But... With that was a lot of religion. Mm -hmm. So being raised by someone who tried to be famous. My dad is an extremely incredible musician. He's like a Tyler England. You put something in his hands and he can play it. But there was like always this desire to be famous mm -hmm. or popular. So there was, well, everything that comes with that. <laughs> everything that comes with that. So I was raised... God stirs up some stuff. I was raised in the presence. And I remember sitting around so many times at my grandparents' house and my grandpa would stop everything. Like we would be eating dinner and he would just stop us. And he'd be like, Jesus is here and we're going to honor it. And everybody would put everything down and you would always turn aside always turn aside for those moments but it was hard being raised in the church and trying to I feel like a lot of ways bring those two worlds together because there was so much religion at church and you did three songs and you did a special and you sat down so there was never a real marriage of that to me until later I almost saw church as something kind of like different and it didn't fit what I felt at my grandpa's house does that make sense yeah but um, I would say when I was about 12 or 13, I was introduced to the Holy Spirit, which is like 
so beautiful. I remember where I was. I remember when it happened. And I remember being a blubbering, feeling like I was a blubbering idiot at youth group. <laughs> but um, I'll bring this back around later on to beloved identity. There was never that sense of it, it's real and I know it's real, but I have to follow all the rules and I never felt like I followed all the rules. I always felt like I never measured up to what was supposed to be done. Um, so we'll just kind of fast forward all that. Um, probably. So the Brownsville revival started in 95 mm -hmm. and the youth group went down for a trip and it was, we got there at 6 AM and we were about three quarters of the way down the sidewalk out front and we stayed all day, <laughs> but it was being on the grounds was like, this is what I felt. And this is reminds me of Abba. Mm -hmm. But it was like, I still had that bad cop or bad cop, good cop kind of like thing that pops talks about now, you know? Um, but I remember just feeling like almost a quaking, just being on the property. And like in hindsight, it was very, denominational, mm -hmm. but being there. Like I remember hearing Melissa Helser's testimony from being there and like literally electricity. So you walked in and the service was incredible. And then the altar call, like I'm a 16 year old kid. I've homeschooled in church my whole life, <laughs> but my God, there was something I needed to repent for. You know, I'd had a bad attitude with my parents or <laughs> I tried to watch a show I wasn't supposed to, you know? But I remember going down front and the power of God hitting me. And for about 24 hours, I shook. Wow. Like I had that like, <gasps> like, and it was just like the inside of my being would just, just, I don't even know how to explain it. But my mom said I did it all night in my sleep. And I, I did it the whole way home from Pensacola back to South Carolina. And then from that point on, it was like, we would go two or three times a year. We would just take a group and go down there. So you went in the very beginning, like mm -hmm. right in 95 when you broke? 96 was like the first time. It was about a year old okay. when we went for the first time. Okay. So then, yeah, after that we would go like Christmas break and like summer break and spring break, you know, like, the times when everybody would go. But I remember one time being prayed for because they would do, they would do worship. Steve Hill would speak. They would do the whole thing. And then they would do the altar call. And then all the leadership would pray for people. So they would just go out. And it was, I've never seen anything like it to this day. Thousands of people. I mean, pressed in like you were trying to see Jesus. But they would pray for you. And I remember being prayed for. And I flew back about five feet. And the guy who prayed for me, he went one way and I went the other. And it was, God, it was incredible. So anyway, I ended up down there. I graduated high school in 98. And I did a year of community college because my mom said I needed to do that. Because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I still don't really know, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so I did a year of community college, and then I packed up and headed to Brownsville for their school of ministry. They had started a two-year school down there. Um, I have a practical um, degree in practical ministry. Um, don't know that I've ever done anything with it, but you know. Um, and I did that for two years, and it was incredible. I mean, we were at church all the time. Like we had services at that point, we were still meeting Tuesday nights through Saturday night and then Sunday morning. So really the only day we had off was Monday. But I mean, you're a kid yeah. and or a high school, no college-ish age. And it was everything that you wanted it to be. I mean all night prayer meetings, all night worship services. It was, but I still had the, I'm not 
good enough. And I think it came back, it, it came back. I've dealt with a lot, but I was raised by a perfectionist. And so I always set these s- standards for myself that were almost unattainable. I'm going to do this, but I'm going to overdo it because if not, I'll get in trouble or it won't be perfect enough. So even when I wasn't, when I outgrew my dad and being at home and doing what he wanted, I needed a sense of, I needed, this is going to sound so weird. I would set a goal and then I would attempt to go above and beyond that goal. And that was just my baseline. Mm -hmm. So if I failed, I could beat myself up. It's so, it's so narcissistically, but that's how I was raised. And so being in that performance all my life, it just, it fed into my spiritual life in ways that I haven't understood until more recently in beloved identity. Um, but we keep moving. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's appreciate you being vulnerable. No. I think the thing with perfectionism is a big challenge. Uh, I, I, I've dealt with that my whole mm-hmm. life. I think sometimes there's still a little bit in there. Mm-hmm. And I, I read this book by um, Brene Brown called the gifts of imperfection. And one thing that I thought was really interesting and helped me mm-hmm. because I think I, I grew up like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think my, my parents used to uh, use this strategy of finding like a cousin or friend that did something really great, oh, yeah. but in just one area. Right. So anytime I was failing in that area, it's like, Oh, see that person, how they are great or this person, mm-hmm. but never talking about the whole person, <laughs> you know, just take the best of each person. I'm kind of a little bit traumatized with comparison. I never do any comparison with my kids. Okay. I've seen like, so-and-so does like this, like never, I, you know, it's each one has their own beauty and, and something great. And, and I really don't like comparisons, mm-hmm. but I, I grew up with this perfectionism mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and so going back to the book, she talks about how many times people think that perfectionism or try to do things perfect is mm-hmm. a virtue, but actually yes. is not a virtue. It's a, the way she explained, I thought it was very good is when you are a perfectionist, you are, you don't, especially for us that are musicians or artists is if you are a perfectionist, you don't create for the, the beauty or the pre- pleasure of creating. You actually create thinking of how that creation will be perceived by other people. So you're creating for the perception that you expect people okay. to have versus creating just out of what's inside of you. And if you hit somebody, if you bless someone, it does. If it doesn't, it's not on you. You just create what's coming out of you. And when you're a perfectionist, you have that problem. You're constantly thinking how this is going, going to come out. And I've dealt with that for many years where, you know, recording and being afraid to release or never having much music out there. And, and I think in this environment we are on is how I got healed because mm. we just play so much spontaneous <laughs> music. It gets recorded, it gets released and we have no say it's out there. <laughs> <Do not. laughs> but I, 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 I definitely understand that. And I think uh, we're going to talk about beloved identity, but it's definitely how I felt like that healing came, but I, I definitely want to talk more about the Brown's view, but I just want to go back a little bit just to hear how you started playing because right. you, you skipped that one. And I'm curious forget. about that one. I'm slightly nervous. <laughs> so keep me on track. Um, so my, I, I, my mom, the Lord told my mom to put me in violin. She did not know a teacher. She didn't even ask my dad, which is like, I think is one of the reasons he was never, not that he wasn't on board with it, but it wasn't his idea. But my mom was like, I know that the Lord told me to put you in the And so she, with the help of my grandparents, put me in lessons and drove me and did that. So I, I was five. Five. So I started when I was five and I took lessons for about 10 
10 plus years with a teacher who dear to my heart, man, I still love that lady so much. She, she was the teacher who you walked in and she was like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes half of my lesson was her like loving on me because I just, I just needed that. And she saw me. Um, so I did that, but like, it's so weird. Like I didn't even start playing. I played a couple of times in church, but it was more like, here's the sheet music. Here's what's that first song I played. I was just thinking about this the other day. Lord, you are more precious than silver. And here's the score. <laughs> Play this during the offertory, <laughs> you know, so far from where we are today. But I remember, I think I was probably 16, 16 or 17, but it was not something like I was a background vocal. I sang in the choir. I just kind of fit wherever my dad needed me to because that's why we were there. You know, we would on the way to church practice parts. Okay. It's your turn to do alto. You do tenor. You do, you know, like it was just constantly, everything was music. Um, but then when I went to Brownsville, I wasn't even going to take my violin because I had separated. I didn't want to play an orchestra because I'm, I'm the poorest net reader, Rudy that you've ever, you and listening to you and Tyler talk. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, I'm so, I'm just, I don't even need to be up here. You're like the pentatonic scale and the minor major 15th. And I'm like, Oh God, I don't know anything. <laughs> but, um, I wasn't even going to take my violin and I took it because I had a friend who's like, just bring it. You, you don't want to get rusty. Right. And so they had, um, they had worship teams at the school. And so I went and, tried out for one of the worship teams at school. And I remember, I don't know if you've heard of Bill and Sarah. He, um, he worked with integrity for a while. He kind of did the choir and stuff there. He was doing it and I was a nervous wreck and he just started playing. And so he's like, play with me. And I was like, okay. Oh my God. And so I played with him and in the he did a key change and I'm like, well, I can do that. <laughs> and so I did it with him. He's like, okay, awesome. And then I heard nothing for six months. And I was like, okay, that didn't go so great. And then I was living in the dorms. We had, they had gotten an old, I think it was an old Baptist facility and they had bought the campus for, cause the school just burst out of, so sorry, back to the Brownsville revival. So many people were coming. So many people were getting changed, transformed. They're like, what's our next step? So they started a school of ministry. Um, and so I went down there to do the school of ministry and, tried out for the worship team. And then however many months later, that song from the revival at Belfast had come out and it was called garments of praise. And it has like this Irish fiddle on there. And so I'm in the dorms. Somebody runs and gets me because we had one pay phone in the lobby. Um, Anna, Bill and Sarah's on the phone. And I'm like, Oh my God, what did I do? Wrong? <laughs> and he's like, Hey, I need you to be at the church at four o'clock. And I'm like, Oh God. Anyway, so I learned that little two bar rift and that's what got me playing at Brownsville. Wow. I showed up for it. It was like a pastor's conference and we played it that night. And then Lyndall was like, Hey, why don't you come back on Friday? I was like, Okay. <laughs> but Lyndall Cooley, so he was the worship pastor there. Incredible. Like I don't have enough to say about being able, I guess, to come up more in the prophetic under him and his tenderness. He would just stand at the keyboard. I mean, thousands of people and the presence of the Lord there. And he would just weep. He was just so tender. And so that was really, I want to say my introduction into like spontaneous or really like loving on Jesus. And, um, so I did that for two years, I think. And wow. during that time, um, they would do pastors conferences and youth conferences and, women's conferences, but the bass player, his name was Benny Johnson and his niece was Jesse Rogers and they had her come in and she was like two years older than me. Single, we're like, you know, single females ready to worship. We were like, she's like, we'll be like Rita Springer and somebody. I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> um, but she came and did Out of the Fire, which was like her first live album that they did at Brownsville. Um, I played on that. There's a story. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but when she came and they called her up for the first time, it was 
I brought a CD for you, but the first time I spontaneously was like introduced to a moment where it was just like, he's here and let's go for it. And I, even earlier today, I was so touched by it because it takes you back to those first moments, those first tender times with him where there was like, it was organic and I hadn't experienced organic much. It was like by the book, by the page. It was totally different. Um, so I started traveling after that. I graduated and did a couple missions trips, played, and Jesse started traveling. So she had her album out and we were doing youth conferences and women's conferences and worship conferences, living it was incredible to come out of, you know, your college age and you're able to be on the road and minister. That was like, it was great. I loved it. Um, then my dad was like, what are you doing with your life? You need to go to college because you'll never make it without a college degree. So I ended up going to Lee University in Cleveland. They took, and the only reason I ended up there is because they took all of my Bible credits and my ministry credits and counted it towards a degree. So I was going to be done in like a year and a half. And I was like, I'll go to Lee. Um, so long story short, Damon was with Karen Wheaton in the ramp. And Bryn had just started coming and leading worship there. And I think maybe ramp, the, they started a ramp in Cleveland, which was where I was at, at Lee. And so I... Jesse called Karen Wheaton and was like, hey, my violin player, Anna, is at Lee. Why don't you guys give her a call or something? So I got a call from, I can't remember, I think it was Joe or Cedric. And hey, we're going to be playing up here at this church. Come out. And so that was when I was introduced to Damon. So I met, I never met him because I was terrified of the man. He had dreads. He was intense. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared of you. <laughs> Literally, I would like avoid the green room. I would go the other way because I was like, I loved it. Like I loved it, but I was scared of him. <laughs> um, I think I told him that one time. He preached at Brownsville too. What I remember his first time there and I was so, I sat in the balcony and judged him the whole time. <laughs> I've told him that. I was like, who is this guy? He's young and he doesn't know what he's doing. It was terrible. <laughs> he wasn't. I was terrible at the time because I was like, it's not Steve Hill and it's not John Kilpatrick. And who does he think he is? That was my religion that I didn't realize I had coming out, you know? <laughs> so I started doing Ramp Cleveland while I finished out there at Lee. I was still a little lost though because the transition from Brownsville. So during my time there, the school had a split. The principal or the director president at the school was not in a denomination and the church was, the church got pressure to have him become ordained. And he said, no, I will, the Dr. Michael Brown, mm -hmm. he's like, no, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And so the school split. So it was like, it was like one of those it, terrible, terrible church splits at its like roommates in homes just ripped apart and, you know, these two went to this school and these two went to this school. So it was just kind of left everyone reeling. And I remember I had a meeting with Dr. Brown and then I had a meeting with Pastor Kilpatrick because I was like, I'm going to do both because these are my professors. These are the people I've been with for two years. I love them. This is my church. And both sides were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I can't choose. This is like ridiculous that y'all are making people choose. Are we not? Don't we all love Jesus? So it got pretty rough. So going to Lee was, it was good, but I was still kind of reeling from just, you've been through church yeah. stuff. Yeah. And you're like, how, again? How was, because one thing that we, we, we say many times is that kind of revival kind of ruins you mm -hmm. in the sense of you experience that presence. Mm -hmm. And then once you get out, especially when it's in a situation like that, where sometimes start questioning things and it's kind of hard to find your place again. Yes. Right. Because you're not going to find no. that kind of presence no. everywhere. 
not everybody is that hungry. Exactly. So how how was that for you, mixing with the transition from split and then not being in that environment anymore? And then going somewhere extremely. It was um, so Lee University at the time. They were Church of God. They're still Church of God, but it's like university now. So it was very, very religious. I mean, oh my goodness, the city of Cleveland has so many churches. I think it's over 500 churches within like the city limits or something. So you leave something that was super authentic. It had its issues, everything. And, and what year was that when you left? I graduated in 01 and I stayed through 02 because I didn't know where to go. So I got a job. I stayed in Pensacola for a while, moved home probably summer of 02. And then I started Lee January of 03 and then ramp. So I started it. My ramp might have started a little after that. Cause I remember getting to Lee and being like, I'm here. I'm not going to church. And I didn't. Cause I'm like, I'm not doing the church. I'm not doing the church thing. I just can't anymore. Um, and so I just kind of was, I didn't really do anything. I didn't pursue the Lord because I'm like, I love you. I know you're here. I know you're with me. I know it's all good, but I just can't get in a church anymore. And that has until now that kind of followed me in a way because there's always this ache once you've tasted yeah. and you've seen. It leaves an ache and you go somewhere and you're like, hmm, no, it doesn't fill anything, you know, but you try. Yeah. Oh, and you keep trying because you know, if you seek me, you'll find me, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's in church, <laughs> but I, so I went to Lee got involved some, I would go to ramp and play conferences at, in Hamilton, just a few, but I met my husband at that time, David, he did not go to Lee, but I met him through a mutual friend at a church that I had started going to. I did start going to church again, but, um, I met him. I knew his worship leader. And so we just kind of started, our churches started kind of doing worship things together. So I met him in April of 04 and we got married. No, wait a minute. We got married in 06 and we knew each other a year. So I must have met him in 05. Anyway, I'm terrible with time sometimes really. Anyway, so we got married. We moved to where he was from, which is Sevierville, Tennessee. So right there, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge area, and they were, he was in a church there. And so I started going to church there too. And then six or seven months later, I was like, I can't go here anymore. I can't, I can't do this church thing. I can't, I just can't. And, um, so the Lord sovereignly kind of moved because it was very unhealthy. You get stuck in something you're like, oh Jesus, this is unhealthy. And I'd seen enough unhealthy yeah. to know we needed to get out. Yeah. So we got out. But during that time, I became reacquainted with a guy that I had graduated school with in Brownsville who had a ministry in Knoxville. I totally forgot about this. His name was Ryan Wyatt and he had Abiding Glory Ministries. And so I went to work with him and I worked as his partner coordinator and doing worship. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, he was having in Bill Johnson and Heidi Baker and Mahesh Shavda and like, it was, I mean, Jerry McFadder would come in, the Alberto and Kimberly Rivera, like Rick Pino came and Sean Foy. I mean, it was just, we did three to four conferences a year for years and it was incredible. It was worship and flow and spontaneous and the word and presence. And then it kind of started going sideways. Um, Bob Jones, um, the possible the prophet Bob Jones, he kind of had taken my friend under his wing and was mentoring him. And he came to all of our conferences and he kind of just was like, no, I'm going to do my own thing and just kind of went off. So that was really hard when you're involved in something that you're like, oh my gosh, this is authentic. This is real. Yes. And then it 
starts not being so. But the Lord miraculously moved us to Greenville, South Carolina, which is close to where I'm from. My husband decided to go to nursing school, which is not his thing, but he did. And we just kind of did life. I worked as a nanny. I had my, we had our first daughter, Ariana. And when she was like 15 months old, I started nannying for a family and David went to school and I nannied and had two more babies. And it was a really hard season because nursing school is like intense. So even within having a family on top of that, it was looking back, I'm, I'm just glad we survived. I'll put it that way. Cause in a lot of ways, it doesn't seem like we should have, but for grace, but David graduated nursing school. Um, we went to a couple of churches here and there. I mean, you know, you'd get involved somewhere in hopes and then no. And then you start going somewhere else and like, okay, this is going to be, mm. and I'm not, I hope you hear my heart. I'm not slanting on towards churches and stuff, but there's so much. I want authenticity. And when I don't feel like there's authenticity, I pull back. Yeah. And I think, I think there's one thing. It's so funny how, how similar our stories mm -hmm. are in some ways. Cause we, I was part of a church that went through revival, heavily influenced by Brownsville. And there were splits and then you get so kind of disappointed and hurt. Yes. And I think that the difficult thing is, I, th I think for me, when I was immersed in that experience, there is a level of being naive. I was very young too. And you kind of believe everything yes. and you're like, Sometimes it's hard in my mind. How can a person that says that's in revival can do this or can do that? And fortunately, people are people. And, and you know, but I think being naive, uh, even though you can, you be susceptible to, yes. to being hurt, I think it is something valuable in the eyes of the Lord. Because you are supposed to come as a, as a child to his breast and child's ch children are naive yes. and they're innocent. And I think that innocence gets robbed mm -hmm. in an environment where there's splits and hurt. But I think if, if you don't fully lose that, I think there's, there's a way that God will bring you back. Mm -hmm. And I think there are people that might be listening to this and they might be saying like, I'm in that situation where, there's too many splits. I've experienced revival and I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. But I think for it, it took me years to find my place back to home and, and a place where you can uh, kind of open your guard again. But Holy Spirit will take you there. And even if when it looks like in many in many moments it looked like there was no no way out out find that place. And I think it, it looks like in your case, you go from one church to another church and you sometimes I just went just because it's a religious thing as well. Yes. And I, I gotta Sunday I gotta go to church. <laughs> My kids need to go to Sunday school. Yes. And it's never about church. Church is important. It's family and it's communion with other people that are thinking and loving the Lord the same way. But it requires your own, uh, you have to build your own relationship yes. and your own experience. So for anybody listening to this, and I think we're going to get to a point where we are now, but there is hope to find a place, find home where you can be yourself and where you can be understood. Uh, and for people that experience revival, sometimes there's a level of being weird, <laughs> being crazy. Uh, but that's how God designed us. Each, each one of us have a unique uh, DNA. There's something unique about us. And 
that's the challenge I have with church, especially the nominations where there's almost a, a requirement for you to fit the mold. There's sure. not very space for you to be yourself or become who you really yes. are. Um, but just want to tell people no, that yes. there's hope. <laughs> there's hope. I hope I don't sound hopeless. No, 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 you don't. You don't. But I think when, <laughs> when, you, when you're vulnerable like that and you share those stories, uh, a lot of people can relate to that. But some people might still be in that mm -hmm. situation in that moment. So mm -hmm. I think it's just... I uh, just want to yes. give a, a, a little uh, motivation yes. that Holy Spirit's seeing you and you're going to find your way. Yes. But going back to Greenville and and David yes. graduated. David back graduated. in South Carolina. We were just living life. We had, and it was funny because we had gone to a couple churches and we had just sat down in our living room and just like, okay. Let's break it down. We've, this is what we've experienced. This is what we've seen. This is what we've been a part of. Who is Abba, our God? I couldn't even say Abba yet to us and our family. And how are we going to live our lives living towards that? And um, we didn't know, but we dreamed. We would just sit and dream of what we thought it would look like. And David was driving to work one day and he said, I just heard the name Damon Thompson. And we hadn't thought of Damon like probably since 07 or 08. I mean, maybe we'd thrown his name out there and mentioned a message, mm -hmm. a message, but not like where he was or what he was doing. Cause we had what just done 16, 16, 2016. It'd been a while, been a, while. A, a while. Um, and He's like, okay. So he looked up Damon Thompson and found his podcast, which he said he had done. He, I think it was like 11, maybe 2010 or 11, somewhere around in there. He's like, I looked it up one time and nothing came up. So he just kind of like passed. And then it was, that had been about 16 and he found the podcast and he started listening. And so 2016 had come to an end and 2017 this is the first of 2017. And he was like, so Damon's in South Carolina. And I was like, yeah, right. He's like, no, seriously, he is. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I want to go down. They have these T3 meetings. He listened to the T3. And um, I was like, okay, awesome. Like I have four children at home. I have Charlie's a baby. I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm just, I bless you. And I was just like, I bless you, honey go down there. And so he went to the very last T3 meeting they ever did. And then they stopped those. And then he started driving down. It was about an hour and 35, 40 minutes from us in Greenville. And so he started going to wilderness and the Lord started rocking his world. I think it was the first wilderness he went to. He rode with another guy and he's like, babe, I made it out to the parking lot. And I literally fell on my car, almost drunk with just presence. And, um, and I was still like, awesome. That's great. You know, you, good for you. you go get that for our family, you know, but literally like with the, my heart was just, yes. But I was like, I'm a mom. I'm raising four children. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not good. I'm just going to stay right here and go to bed at eight 30, which I still do sometimes, <laughs> but, um, go. And so he started doing that. So for most of the year he did that, but we had actively been looking for a home in Greenville. Have you been to Greenville? Yeah. One oh my time. God. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's and it was like, this is where we're supposed to be. This is where would you, what better place is there to raise a family? You know, we were like, yes, we had friends in the community that were starting coffee shops and like restaurants. And like, we had a, a younger friend group there. We were kind of like the peers and we were just enjoying, we really had a season, a sweet season there. And it was great. Probably the last two years. And, um, we couldn't find a house. 18 months. Look at a house, fall through. Look at a house, got outbid. And so it was August of 2017. And it was my birthday, August 5th. And a house came on the market. And I was like, this is it. This is it. We have finally found the house. The next morning we went to look at it. We put an offer in. We bid up and above and beyond so we could secure that property. And next morning, nope. And I was like, that's when it hit me. 
there's something more than us just not being able to find a house. So I was like, hey, why don't we go to Hope Chapel next Sunday morning? And we had briefly talked about it. He had gone to, I think, a Friday night revival, like maybe once or twice. I hadn't been at all. And he's like, okay, let's go. So that's next Sunday morning. I think it was like the 13th. We show up at Hope Chapel in the middle of the woods on a Sunday morning. And we sat down. And that was when we were still doing pre-service prayer. And so we got there and he's like, hey, why don't you go sit down front? And I was like, okay. So I just went up and like kind of knelt down and this then service started. And Matt sang Home by Jason Upton. And at that point, Jason hadn't recorded it yet. Um, so the only reason, the only way you heard it is if you had kind of like heard him like on a random podcast or something. And then Damon walked in and the service started and I was just like, what have I walked into? And I went and sat back down in my seat and it was a feeling of, I've never not been here. Like I've always been here. And he was like home. And Damon and Johnson both spoke that morning on home. And we were at that point, it was like, okay, we're done. So we, that was August. Sorry, I keep back in the way. Um, so August through December, we just drove every Sunday and came to church. Um, we met Harvey and started looking for a house. And then four days before Christmas on December 22nd, 2017, we moved to South Carolina, to Batesburg, Leesville, and started the journey of the screen door. Mm. So it was the journey of beloved identity, but the journey of like being somewhere where you knew it was where you were supposed to be, but you felt more alone than you had in your entire life. David got pneumonia our first month there, missed three weeks of work. And I was like calling family in Tennessee because I didn't have anybody to call for help. But it like throughout that process, it was a remote, why are you here? What have you whispered in the, what have you thought of in your heart? You know, what are the dreams and desires? And it was just a process of really unraveling everything that we had ever known or everything we thought, who we thought he was, who we thought leadership was, who we thought church people were, you know, like it's a process. I mean, and you're there with humans. We're all human. Yeah. But I started going through and I hate the word deconstruction now. I wish there was like a de unraveling. Mm -hmm. I'll do an unraveling. But during that time, I, I cried. It was like the Holy Spirit showed me like I had, I was not, I was raised in a home where we weren't allowed to show emotion. So you, you just, put it inside and tucked it away. And I even, I started talking to Johnson because I literally cried for like four months. Like I would just all of a sudden spontaneously combust out of my face. And at first I hated it, but then I realized it was a cleansing and a stripping away of a lifetime of pain, of hurt, of rejection, of fear, of all the things that had been put on me. I never put on myself but that were put on me. I remember one time I just fell on the bed crying and my, my young, my oldest daughter just came and held me and telling me it's going to be okay. But being able to be vulnerable with my children during that time, mommy has to get this out. Mommy has to allow Jesus to come in. And I had an encounter and, um, I won't share the whole thing, but at the end of the encounter, I look up and Abba standing in front of me. And I was exhausted. And I said, I want to come to you. And I just can't. And Jesus was like right here to my right. And he came over and he literally leaned down and laid down on top of me. And he absorbed me into himself. And then he turned and he walked straight into Abba. And he's like, I will carry you there. And you never have to leave. And so in moments when I may feel like Something tries to sneak in. I was like, no, I was carried into Abba and I've never left and I don't have to leave. 
So that was one of the most that has, I don't, you have encounters, but for me, that was like, I am, that was my, I am in him moment. Um, and then, so sorry. Um, so we went, I never, I practiced my violin sometimes, but it was not something that was on the, I was homeschooling. We moved and I started homeschooling. So there's that. <laughs> I don't homeschool anymore. <laughs> no, I love my kids, but I prefer to be a mom and not a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we just went and loved, just loved being there, being in the room, being apart, listening to you guys. Like, I remember just being in the room and being like, if I never play again, I don't care because this worship is, is, is everything, you know? And so Tyler at the time, Mr. I play everything. And I'll just, I'll just make a quick point yes. that I think uh, it just came to my mind is I think we do have dreams, desires, and things, you know, we want to do and become, but I think in this environment, it always goes back to the, the reason we first connected with this was his presence. Yes. And it's almost like the enemy sometimes wants to distract us from why we are actually here. Uh, and in his presence, and Apostle talks about that all the time, how uh, uh, proximity fixes everything. And everything we, we dream, everything we want, will come from that proximity. And, and I think this... I had the same feeling when I first visit South Carolina because I'm like, I don't know anybody here. This place is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and as soon as I step in the church, I'm like, this feels like home. It's so weird. It feels like I know this place. It feels like I know these people and I don't know anybody. Bones. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting how the Lord does those things because home is where he is. And I think if if you are in those moments of uncertainty or there's all the things that was were put on you, on us, and I feel like I, I there's a lot of things that were put on us, who we should be or how we should look or so many different things. And and even society does that, mm -hmm. right? What kind of job you should have, how much money you should make. There's all these pressures and in the presence of God all of those things will will basically you will become who you're supposed to be in his presence versus you're trying to achieve something uh, and um, so I think the pursuit continues to be his presence be in him and all those things get adjusted and even in that situation that was so beautiful you said where you got to that point where I cannot move any forward, any step forward, he will carry you if that's necessary. Because his desire is that we are in his presence. So I'm so beautiful that you're you're being so vulnerable and, yeah. and, and um I appreciate that. But so you were saying then yes, you, you didn't want to play anymore. And that was so you were there end of seventeen when yes. you moved. Yes. Okay, end of seventeen. So then like the beginning of 2018. So we were just there living life, adjusting, you know, you're moving. Like Bryn mentioned the last podcast, he, he did the five-year thing. Was that psychologists say that you only need one major event every five years? And I was like, okay, we've been in crisis for like the last 10 years of our lives, babe. We're not healthy. It's like, oh. but we are. So Tyler had been playing mandolin at the time. I didn't even know he played keys and he had a dobro, which I just love the dobro and it just set up there. And so I think it was, it was April and he was, it was before church and he'd walk back to the bathroom. I was like, hi. And he's like, hi. And I was like, so are you ever going to play that dobro up there? And he's like, ah, you know, I don't know. And we started talking. He's like, do you play? I was like, yeah, I've played, you know, a little. And so I was like, yeah, I went to ramp, you know, we just kind of, but we started like connecting the dots because he played, he had had a friend of mine play drums. I was like, yeah, I've played with it, blah, 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 blah. So that was kind of it. And that was a service. 
that Matt had had that dream where he reached up and grabbed so, the songbook. Tell, I think this, this story is so amazing. So I think it's, it's valuable if you share that story. And, and, and it happened to me very similar. And I think for us that came through playing church for many years and all the splits, all the issues that we've seen um, and being used, right? Uh, <laughs> and the way that God brought us together to play it was so beautiful because it was never uh this thing of oh let's use that guy's talent or he pays or he does let's leverage that it was never like that it was very by the holy spirit and i shared my story the first the first podcast anybody want to go back I, i shared that but i think it's it's i love that story so just to give some context matt putman and we're going to have him in the podcast soon um he he had a dream and I'll, I'll let uh anna share about it so he was he was the worship leader in south carolina and a day before that service that he talked to Tyler. i think it was like either or friday or week. saturday okay so yeah love you to share I'm that story <laughs> i think it was friday or saturday he had they had been playing had he been playing the cd or he had, no, a dream. he had a dream first yes he had a dream and in the dream he had pulled off an old like song book like the chord chart book and it was out of the fire by jesse rogers and so he grabbed the cd and started listening to it and so there's a song on there and i'm not going to be able to remember which one it is rudy anyway there's a song guys um and on it so this is a little backstory the song had the the story is a little, I've tried to clarify a couple of times, but now I'm really clarifying here, guys. <laughs> so during the live album, I played and they had a flute player play. So Steve and I were there at the live recording. We played. Well, the recording's done. Everything's packed up. And they're like, oh, we forgot to plug you guys in. So the whole recording had happened. We had played our parts. It was great. And we didn't make it on the recording. So they went into the studio. I was out of town. They went into the studio and it's actually a cello player. Her name's Sarah who played on the CD, but Matt pulled the CD out and he's listening to it. And he goes, God, send us a violin player like this. So he, so he had a dream where he gets the CD. The, he got the songbook and pulled it off and it's the Jesse Rogers out of the fire chord book. That's on the dream. In the dream. So, so then he goes and gets the CD and the starts listening to the CD. And they were playing it. We had come, I think it was close to that 10 day. We'd come out of that 10 day of prayer. Yeah. Do you remember that? April. I think it was after that. Okay. That would be for Matt to tell. I can't. Anyway, so he starts listening to the CD. So it's actually a cello player, mm -hmm. but I was there playing on the live recording, mm -hmm. but he prays, send us a violin player. So he go, Tyler goes up and he's like, Hey, I just met this girl and blah, blah, blah. She traveled with Jesse Rogers. And Matt was like, that's the song I've been playing. That's the dream I had. So I didn't know any of this had happened because it happened down front at the huddle before, before service. And so in the middle of service, Damon stops. I didn't even know he knew, you know how he is. And he's like, so Anna, I know you don't know. I know who you are, but I do. Something like that. And I was like, oh, God. Because you know Pops knows. But, um, and he told told the story. And for me, it was, I mean, that was years and years. And that was a, a such a incredible time in my life. But it was like a forgotten time. And for that to be highlighted was just, it was so humbling. Mm -hmm. And so service ended and I ran out the door because I was like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. I just wanted to disappear. And I didn't want to make it like into a, I didn't want to like, Hey, so that's me. And Matt came out in the parking lot and like, Hey, I just wanted to say thank you. And anyway, so that's how I first connected with Matt. But, um, but then it was months. It was, I believe August. Um, it was the first of August. I played at, I played one Sunday 
with Matt and Tyler. It was like before youth camp or something like that. And, but I knew I was like, I'm not rushing this. This was the dream. Apostle said this when it's time for me to go up there. I think that's one thing I would say to musicians or people who feel like wait on the timing of the Lord. Because I could have been like, hey, I'm here. I want to play. Yeah. But that would have gotten me in the back row. Yeah. Um, but not in a bad way. But it's all about the timing and the release of the Holy Spirit. And so it that was April. I think it was August. And the funny part is that I was in service. It was incredible. That Sunday morning was incredible. And I was like literally in an encounter with the Lord. And... um. Damon said, it's, I hear the sound. It's time for, to release the sound of the violin. Mm-hmm. And um, the Lord had told me to like, we were doing, Matt was doing um, King of My Heart. And I'm, before I'm a musician, I'm a worshiper. Like I've always just had a heart for extravagant worship. Um, I love worshiping. And I worship in my kitchen and I worship in my bedroom just like I would at home because it's not something I do. It's who I am. And I was just worshiping you. Know, I'm going all out. And the Lord was like, shh, stop. And I'm like, okay. So I got real quiet and it's going on. And um, I stopped and I just waited. And Matt started singing, you're never going to let me down. And Opa said, that's how I feel about you. He said, you know, I'll never let you down. And I said, yes, sir. I know you'll never let me down. But there was that part of me is I'm going to let you down. And it was him telling me. And that moment transformed a part of my brain, a part of my heart. Because there's always, a, I know who he is and I know he's good. But me seeing myself as, I'm going to let you down now. But so that started a journey. And then I started playing like the next week, I think it was. But um, I remember being so nervous. <laughs> Cause I'm like, but it was, it has been one of the most beautiful things that I've ever been a part of playing with you guys and being in this place and being under apostle. And I believe it's the next year. So then after that, Kannapolis and Hefzibah, I have my Hefzibah tattoo. <laughs> um, learning that his delight is in me was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever had to go through or ever had to process through because the whole, you're not, you don't measure up, you're not enough. And then the stripping started of him just pulling away. You're in me. It's okay. You're never going to let me down. And then we get to beloved identity and we realize we don't know anything. I'm like, I... I want to think I know a lot because I'm 40, I'm 43. I've lived life, but coming to this place and coming here, I don't know as much as I thought I did, but I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful. Not trying to have it figured out all the time. Yeah. Not trying to have the ducks, my ducks in a row and my eyes dotted and my T's crossed. I can be a mess, but I'm his mess. Yeah. And he loves me yeah. in my mess. And it's helped me be a mom. Because I know even the first little bit of raising children, still being in the system, and then raising kids, like m- my oldest three tell me all the time that I don't discipline my youngest enough. <laughs> but he has a freedom and a fire in him that I tried to snuff out of my others. Because they were supposed to act a certain way and they were supposed to look a certain way and they were supposed to be a certain way. And so coming in full circle, I'm like, no, 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 you be a kid. Like telling my 14-year-old, be silly, be funny, and have a good time and be a kid. And you don't have to have it all together. Yeah. Because I was raised to have it all together. Yeah. And even if you didn't, like my family was super dysfunctional, Rudy. But I thought it was normal. And it took me going on this journey with Abba 
Because being raised in the South, I don't know. I don't know culturally if that translate with, with you as much, but you, you, you lurk a certain way and you don't let the family secrets out. So I was raised, my dad was very, um, emotionally abusive and very mentally abusive, but I never knew that. I thought it was normal. I thought I was raised in a normal household, normal circumstance. Everything was fine. And then coming on the other side of that and realize, oh, I almost, I'm just going to be vulnerable. Sometimes I wish he'd have just hit us because I could have identified that as abuse. But the other, I just thought it was how everybody was and that's how everyone acted. But then to unlearn and to unpack the trauma of that has been harder than I think the other would have been. But there's, sorry. Just for people out there, if if you've been through something like that, Abba's so good. And he will walk you through the hardest seasons and the hardest times. And he will hold you so close. And I think now at 43, I can look back and be thankful for every hard thing that I went through. And everything that I've learned. And it's made me more tender. And I think coming to South Carolina and being with the apostle, he always says, your tears are your compass. And I will cry at the drop of a hat. But I always turn it back and remember, like, it's because I've come through so much. And there are always tears of thankfulness. Because he's held me. He's held me so tight. Sorry. I think uh, the the beautiful thing about the beloved identity is being able to be in a relationship with the Lord that he's not expecting anything from mm -hmm. us. He's not putting yeah. any expectations on us. And I think a lot of the traumas we have come from parents, society that put specific expectations that then you live your whole life trying to fit yes. and trying to reach that expectation and then as soon as you feel like you reached that expectation changes <laughs> it's something else they want something else and then you constantly are in that uh you're never happy you're never satisfied you're never uh enjoy anything because Okay, there's an there's yes. another thing. And I think coming into this and that's why being seated and being at rest and understanding the love of Abba, it's a love that it's just given to us. You being you the way you are is all he wants. Yes. You don't need to change, you don't need to do anything. And if any change is necessary, that comes in his presence. Yes. So it's not something you're going to fight for. You're going to work for. You're just going to become in his presence. And the I think the pressure that comes out of you mm -hmm. once you go into a relationship that you don't need to do anything to impress. Yeah. You don't need to do anything to prove anything. It's just so amazing. And if you really think about, there's so many relationships that people have that comes with expectations. There's, you need to prove something, you need to behave a certain way. And then you add religion into that. It mm. just becomes something suffocating. very toxic and suffocating. And I think a lot of people out there feel that pressure, you know? And um, so I think the, I hope that some of something that people can get from this is once you find, once you understand, and, and we're still learning that how to become that beloved son, because it, it's beautiful that Pops keeps bringing us back yes. and reminding us, because it's the only way to live with real freedom and joy. Yes. And it's not living with that kind of pressure mm. of expectation. And actually, you being you is enough. Yeah. And that's all Yahweh wants. It 
it's us being us. So it's it's so beautiful. And and for musicians, because one of my hopes is that this podcast reaches other musicians. Um there's another kind of pressure that musicians face, I think artists face in general. You know, it's there's a sense that you're never satisfied. I can speak for myself sometimes. You, you never feel like you play well enough. There's, you know, you're always comparing yourself to other people. Uh, in church, there's this whole thing about using, you know, uh, using you and, and people just looking for the talent. And it can become as mechanical. And worship can become just a job. Yeah. You know, a lot of musicians that are in church is just a job. Mm -hmm. And I've done that just as a job, just to get a paycheck. And it's empty. It's not fulfilling. And one of the most amazing things that we experience here, and this is not the only place, but it's the place that God brought us together, yes. is to be able to go into his presence where... We, we can wait for what he wants to hear. And that's all we do. Yes. And that requires sometimes you're not going to be playing or you're going to be playing for four hours. You never know. Right? But it's the beauty of freedom in his presence. And there's something, and, and I hope, other musicians can experience this because it's healing. It like it just completely healed me to be able to come into his presence and we're just going, just going to play something new and fresh that he wants to hear. And we're going to feed off each other's frequency. And that's what I love so much about playing with you is to be able to feed off each other's frequency. And then we can just create something for him yes mm. and that it's it doesn't matter if you it doesn't even matter your or your level of playing or not because that's not what he's looking for anyway he's looking for and 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 pops talks about how it's not about you making a new sound but you're becoming a new man the new man the new woman creates a new sound it's mm that beloved identity in you actually releases a frequency and in our case comes through our instrument. Uh, so I just hope other people can experience that, but it starts with you going deep into that understanding. You're not living under that expectation, pressure, and releasing that frequency with no fear. Yes. With no fear. You're not doing for yes. men. And... This is so beautiful, Anna. I'm I'm just so so glad you <laughs> you're sharing all this, and just so we can kind of uh, transition to here, and then I think we we will be good. Uh, so South Carolina, yes. we, you were there for I was there for five years, so you were there for about four years. I think we had we were kind of going into our fifth year, so December. Would have been fifth year, and then the March. stole off to here. Uh, you know what? Yeah. So David, David had kind of, and I didn't realize this until later. David in January was like, "Do you think Damon would move?" I'm like, <laughs> "No, crazy." But he started feeling like this underlying like vibration inside of him, and I'm like, "You're just crazy." So we get there for that service in March. And Damon says, we're moving to Mobile. And my first thought was, okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, this is good. I felt, I felt the wind of the Holy Spirit on it when he said it just felt right. But then it's coupled with, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know, like we were putting roots. Yeah. You put roots. We owned a home there and we were, we loved it there. It had become home. And so then your face, my, um, my brother-in-law, Nathan was planning to move and he had come down that weekend to like scope out the area to kind of see where he would want to go. His parents were putting their house on the market that same weekend so they could move to South Carolina too. So Friday night happens and we're 
David literally drove around in like a rage. He because he, he was. I, I should have joined him. Should have <laughs> called me. <laughs> I didn't know this. I went home and he's like, I "Need you go drive around and scream in my car?" And I'm like, "Okay, babe, it's okay." But like he and he because he's dealt with his own fear of abandonment with leadership, and so it for him it was like, "Well, here we go again," you know. Um, but pretty quickly we decided, you know what, why are we here? Why did we move here to be under apostle? So are we ready to be apart from him? No. So we knew pretty quickly that it would be a transition that we would be making, but I mean, we took our time. We put our house up for sale. You know, I think that was March. We didn't move until August. So we moved because we just knew that we wanted to be tethered with pops and now being able to call him. I can fully say Abba now and feel it. And I can say pops now and not feel like, yes, sir. But like he's pops. Yeah. And so, you know, moving here comes with exhaustion. You've packed up a family. And you've moved again. You're the king of moving, so I know you know what I mean. But um, getting here and just the busyness. So last fall, it was prayer. One of the prayer services, um, he just issued an invitation. He's like, I just want you to take a season and you're going to behold me. And um, so that was my posture. Anytime I got with him, I, I behold you. And then it started transitioning. As you behold me, you become like me. And so all last fall, I mean, leading, I dealt with though, I dealt with a lot of insecurity when we moved because it's a new place. It's a new building. I felt so alone over there, Rudy. I was on the other side of the stage by myself. I'm like, I'm apart from everyone. But just, I mean, just everything that comes with that. So it stirs up emotions of I'm in a new place. I'm having to learn new people. I'm having to play with a new band. And like Tyler is my security blanket. I've told him that I'm like, if you're playing, as long as you're playing, I'm okay. And then playing with you is like, you guys are like anchors to me. Um, cause I don't consider myself a great musician. Oh, come on. I no, I, I'm a vessel. And I've fully released myself. Like, I'll get up there sometimes and Tyler will be like, hey, Anna, play. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't have anything. But Tyler will be like, play. But sometimes I need Tyler to be like, Anna, play. Because I'll completely hold back and then something will come out of me. But I very much move by like what I'm feeling. So if I'm not like feeling, then I can get my head. So I need you guys. (laughs) To keep me but, but, I, but that thing with feeling sometimes is dangerous because yeah. he deserves the worship no matter if we're feeling you're right and i think even myself many times you know you're not feeling but you mm-hmm. come into his presence mm-hmm. and like he deserves our praise and yes. worship no matter what yes if you're tired or not if you're feeling or not if you're hearing or not yes i think he still deserves it yes and um so I've just, you know, close my eyes and go nuts. <laughs> You're so much better at that. And I was actually curious because not many, like I've played with a lot of um, classical musicians mm-hmm. and all my friends that play violin or cello, they mm-hmm. were always classically trained. And they really struggled playing by ear. So mm-hmm. just a, a side note here, I was just curious, did you always play by ear? That's how you, you, you learn. I was just well, curious about that. <laughs> so my dad is an incredible musician. He has one of those ears. Like we're driving down the road and he's like, they're in the key of, you know, and I'm just like, what are you talking about? Um, but I started taking the Suzuki method, which is a classical mm-hmm. method, but they had cassettes. And my mom would play them as I went to sleep at night and I would memorize the songs. And then I would go to lesson and my teacher really thought I was playing, but I was playing from memory. So I got caught about halfway through book one (laughs) and I hated note reading. I hated it. So if she could play it for me, 
I could play it back. So I would always kind of manipulate can that. Can you play it for me? <laughs> um, so yes, I, I think it's just hereditary or, yeah. you know, I just learned that it came naturally because that's how my dad was. Um, so I'm much better at ear than I am mm -hmm. like looking at a sheet of music. Oh, so that's better anyway. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't make it here. I really couldn't if I needed sheet music, but, um, but you were saying that you had a little bit of insecurity when we first moved. Yeah. Why do you think? Yes. I think I needed to work through more stuff. Yeah. I really think like my heart was in a place where it was becoming open. I feel like the fall, there's always something that starts stirring in me in the fall and I feel it and I don't understand what's going on or I don't recognize it at first. I just kind of feel like a, a transition or a shift in the wind or something. And so I think last year I started feeling that. And instead of going into belovedness, I, I leaned over into insecurity. Um, I mean, I didn't stay there long, but it happens, you know, it happens. Like sometimes it'll just out of nowhere. Oh, I hit a wrong note. So I can either go one way. <laughs> I hit a wrong note. Awesome. Or oh, I hit a wrong note. Everybody heard that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like that, but it, it was good. And I don't really know how to explain it other than it was just like, I felt like it was another season of him taking me into a deeper level. Are you going to trust? Are you going to lean in deeper? Are you going to release stuff to me more fully? And almost, I want to say like taking off an old person, like another level that I didn't realize was there. So I struggle. I mean, I even sent you and Tyler a text. I think at some point, like, Ooh, I'm feeling like I don't need to be up here with you guys, but knowing it wasn't coming from, it was coming from a in place of insecurity. It wasn't who I really was, Yeah. but just really working through that and coming back into, I am who I am. Yeah. I am beloved and I'm his daughter. And this is what I have to offer him. And I'm going to extravagantly lavish that on him. Yeah. And so that's my, that's what I try for my posture to be, especially I love Tuesday morning prayer and Friday nights, but like, I don't know if I get on that stage ever without being, there's a level of awe and thankfulness to even be a part of this, Yeah. to even to be in the building. Does that make sense? Like, it's just, I, it's never on me that the honor, because I could have lived my whole life and just heard about this, or I could have lived it and never heard about this. Yeah. But for such a time as this, we were chosen before the foundations of the earth to be in this place at this time for our kids to be a part of this generation. And like, that is, that's everything right now for me. Yeah. I even, I tried to, because when we moved, looking back at our so many special moments we had together mm. in South Carolina, and then suddenly you don't have, you're not there anymore. I'm like, Man, we had it so, sometimes we have that thing where like you had it so good you don't even know. Yeah. And that's kind of how I, I try to stay, uh, keep it in my mind that how special it is. You just got to keep the level of honor really high at all times. Yeah. Because what we experience is really, really special. It does, as, as you know, we play our whole lives, uh, you know, same age, yeah. born same month, same week. And uh, we've we've seen a lot, yeah. you know, and just to be able to have this level of freedom and to enjoy this level of presence and to be able to be ourselves um, and then to have our kids right there oh, worshiping and crying in the presence of the Lord and them not having to deal with all these things. They'll be able to, yeah. you know, be able to grow up 
with this level of freedom, understanding their identity, and who knows what yes. they're going to do, you know. And and just the honor for us to be able to be that soundtrack for them yes. right now. I almost see like as a soundtrack. I feel like, so good. you know, you, you mentioned playing early on, you said about, oh, when there was like the offering and they put me to play a song. It's almost like the only spot that, you could have an instrument is like in the offering, nobody's paying attention. It's like, let's let them play a little bit. Uh, so just the fact that we have so much instrumental music, it's crazy to it's me crazy. to think about. Crazy, you know. But I think that just, I what I love about instrumental music is just the freedom that gives people to go anywhere they want to go. Exactly. You're not kind of attached to a lyric you actually can just go anywhere so it's it's so much fun to do it oh so much fun. and to have our kids there and to be doing this together i'm so thankful that you did this today thank you, uh, thank you for it's really special i've been wanting to do this for a while and if anybody wants to connect with you any 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 final words people want to connect with you you know in social media they can find you <laughs> how can people find how you? can people find me um on facebook i'm anna witten it's my maiden name anna witten ivy and i have an instagram it's anna ivy i think a-n-n-a ivy -N -N and the ivies they cook amazing oh, and they you. bake amazing stuff thank so she has all the bread if you want to get some Beautiful bread, right, Anna? <laughs> so I will leave you guys with some music that you recorded. So I'm going to maybe put the CD you brought, uh, but I also love to put the last record that you, oh, yeah. the last track you recorded. I just want to just share a little bit about that and then. Yeah. So I, I can't even remember. It was probably two months ago. It was a Friday night that you weren't there, Rudy. Thanks for not being there. <clears throat> but Pops got done speaking, and he was like, this is going to sound harsh, but Anna, I want you to get up there and play by yourself. And I was like, I'm going to have a heart attack right now. I can't play by myself. And Tyler was like, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm like, is it okay? Are you sure? But I really, like, I knew it was right. Yeah. You know, I'm just not used to playing by myself, like, in a setting like that. Um, so afterwards, he just mentioned, hey, let's get her in the studio to record something. And so Tyler called and I was in his closet in his room in his house because it was the quietest place. Um, but just recorded that that set in one take. And then um, he added Luke came and played some guitar on it and he added some strings and stuff. Um, not strings, but like pads. Mm -hmm. Um but it just felt like the whole time I was playing, I just felt like, like take a deep breath and go into that. You know how you can take a deep breath, but then you come into that rest where you exhale. And the whole time I was playing, I just felt like if this is a big deep breath and into rest. So that's what I felt. I think Tyler named it rest, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to have that track for you guys, and I'll put the links to Anna's social media so you can connect with her. Let her know uh, if this blessed you. Anna, thank you so much. Love thank you. you it's an honor to be doing live together, Absolutely. music together, and all the so many amazing moments we experience with the Lord, and there's so much more to come. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I hope you were blessed by this episode and I'll see you next time.